Hi, everybody. Welcome to this session, which is uh, Safaricom's journey with OpenShift. My name is Christopher Saul. I look after some of the major accounts uh, for Red Hat in Kenya and Nigeria, and I'm the account manager for Safaricom, who are obviously one of our key strategic customers. Uh, these sessions are my, my favorite from these kinds of events. I think if you're doing these kinds of events and you don't have customers, real customers on stage or virtually uh, talking, you've got a question. Uh, what's going on but so we're really pleased to have uh, Alex Lagat, uh, Krip Karui and also Chris Mwanzia from Safaricom with us today. So Chris is a senior manager cloud and infrastructure solutions as well as manager container management and automation. So Chris we were uh, chatting the other day I think you have two jobs but currently only one salary which is the, probably the same for most of us we all feel like that at, at one time or another. And Alex is a senior manager, enterprise integration and, and order management. So welcome to the session, gentlemen. Uh, thanks again for joining us. I think perhaps to, to kick things off, um, and I'll start with, with you, Chris. Um, what do you do on a day-to-day -day basis? What, what's the reality behind the job title? So we'll hear from Chris and then Alex, just so people watching can get a feel of what your actual real day-to-day -day job is. So Chris, over to you to, to give us that info. Hi, uh, hi everyone. I, I, I think I can just uh, kickstart on our day-to-day -day, uh, activities. Uh, we, we look generally on the cloud infrastructure. Uh, basically, that's where the, the, the infrastructure, uh, the servers, the storage, uh, the operating system, the databases, and uh, other cloud, uh, uh, cloud and container environments, that's where they, they really reside. So basically, we, we work out on, on a project basis and as well as operations uh, activities. Uh, for their cloud infrastructure. Fantastic. And Alex, uh, what's what's the truth behind the, your job title? What, what's your day-to-day -day real job include? So my day-to-day -day work, as Chris has said, uh, is projects delivery and operations. So I lead a team of around 35 engineers who are uh, both developers and operations engineers responsible for developing APIs for the various projects and supporting APIs that are already in production. Both, uh, which is uh, uh, the APIs are resident on our, on our enterprise service bus. Thank you. Thanks. And Chris, could you just, just give us a quick summary about your current Red Hat installed base? I know OpenShift is in place and that's the main focus of today's discussion, but you do use a, a reasonable amount, a number of other Red Hat solutions. Are you able just to give us a rough idea of, of what Red Hat is doing currently in your, in your environment? Uh, uh, just to mention, um, uh, the, the Red Hat environment is quite huge in, in our place, and I think uh, it, it's never been a one-day kind of journey. We started a big, uh, uh, a number of uh, years back in terms of uh, adopting a number of uh, solutions one by one. So the first one that we started mainly with is uh, the Red Hat Linux, that's a base, and uh, whereby we have a number of servers running on uh, standalone and uh, virtualized as well. We also did uh, a Red Hat virtualization, uh, which is uh, an alternative to our, our VMware uh, virtualization environment. Uh, that's really uh, gives the, the, the business an alternative to run their, their services uh, across. Uh, we also uh, used uh, Ansible for our automation operations and um, especially for, the, for our daily to daily activities, things that we frequently uh, do so we have uh, ansible and we are quite uh, extensive use of it so uh, uh, our developers really rely on it for their delivery in terms of ensuring their products are, are well uh, uh, automated and uh, uh, delivery to the market is very fast uh, we also use a uh, red hat satellite uh, for our patch management and our monitoring of the, the ecosystem the red hat uh, ecosystem uh, in terms of uh, ensuring uh, we, we get uh, uh, vulnerability checks and uh, scans uh, as frequent as possible, and was, uh, as well as um, uh, doing the updates uh, to the Linux environment. Uh, we recently uh, took over the, the option of uh, deploying uh, OpenShift, uh, which is uh, quite uh, doing well. And I think uh, Alex, being my first customer, is comfortably uh, using the, the, the service comfortably, and uh, uh, we are growing going forward. Uh, we also using uh, cloud forms for our Red Hat infrastructure management uh, that really ensures that uh, in terms of uh, uh, operations activities, 
the team is able to, to manage the number of uh, uh, environments that we have internally. Uh, uh, there's on, uh, also an ongoing project of uh, OpenStack, which is uh, building our, 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 our cloud uh, infrastructure. And uh, this, uh, the main reason is because of uh, self-service uh, implementation for, for our internal customers uh, to ensure we are able to deliver the services as soon as possible and guys can, and, and the team members can do uh, self-provisioning uh, for themselves. Uh, those are the major, the products that we are using. We've done quite a number of tests on other products and especially recently we did a, a test on self, uh, went with the open source technology first and uh, 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 before now we can embark on the journey for the, for the enterprise version uh, going forward. Uh, we also testing the, the, the solution for, for, for asset management, uh, which is uh, uh, it's going to be very important for us going forward to ensure we have a track of all the services and solutions that we are using internally. Fantastic. Thank you. Thanks. I appreciate that. So I think uh, I'll go to Alex, actually. As Chris mentioned, uh, you were the first customer, Alex. So how did the OpenShift journey specifically begin? Is that something that you and your team kicked off as a request uh, to Chris in infrastructure, or was that something that the infrastructure guys came to you and said, is this something you need? So uh, yeah, my question for you, Alex. Uh, I would say neither, because uh, uh, we have, we, uh, <laughs> what happened is uh, when we started now uh, developing cloud native applications, the only option we had then was Kubernetes, and uh, the, the open source Kubernetes, which uh, it's a fact that the learning curve is quite steep. So what I did then uh, around two years ago, a year ago, sorry, I approached my colleagues from Vodafone Egypt, who are already way ahead in terms of uh, uh, cloud native uh, architecture uh, adoption. So they told me that they, they, we discussed and realized that they have, uh, they have a very good uh, ad, uh, installation of Red Hat OpenShift. And also they were developing microservices both in Java Spring Boot and Tipco Container Edition. And from their use case and uh, over, over quite a, a long, uh, long, long hours of discussions, we realized that they are able to achieve better performance, better throughput, when they use Red Hat OpenShift, and they are also being able to onboard developers and engineers to support it at a, at a very faster rate uh, compared to Kubernetes. Then I remember also we had, a, I, I, I used to join a webinars uh, shared by Red Hat and I could ask questions. And from that, one of the administrator or the host of the webinar uh, referred me to you, Chris. And after discussions on email, uh, you told me there is already an, an uh, ongoing POC of Red Hat OpenShift in Safaricom. And that's how I was able to sync up with Chris and we started the journey. So after around six, eight months, we were able to complete the POC and the payments were made and the licenses purchased is when now we started uh, formally deploying our microservices on Red Hat OpenShift which we have had, uh, as Chris has said, uh, very good success stories. Uh, I think I'll be able to get a chance to highlight one or two of them. Thank you. Definitely, Definitely. Yes. thanks. So that, that's interesting. So Chris, it sounds as if the you and infrastructure uh, and Alex and his team in the development world, you were kind of thinking a little bit in parallel. So you kind of, kind of your, your thinking was at the same, same stage. I think it's it's interesting what what you mentioned, Alex. What I come across, what we come across a lot uh, at Red Hat is people do kick off with the the open source with community editions. So I wanted to ask you specifically, Chris. And you mentioned you'd been testing Ceph community edition as well. Did you who what led the decision to go to actual enterprise rather than just having community throughout your environment? Um, maybe, maybe just to take up, and uh, maybe I can just go a, bit, a little bit back on uh, based on the other product as well. I, I think Alex mentioned in the last two years, we've had uh, quite a digital transformation journey that has really helped us in terms of uh, reviewing our current applications uh, stack and also uh, remodernizing um, a number of uh, services and uh, adopting uh, more of our microservices uh, technologies going forward. 
And uh, we saw the interest uh, in terms of the infrastructure, how we can accommodate such a kind of requirement. Uh, that's when we started testing some of these uh, 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 products. And uh, uh, the beauty about it is because uh, uh, Red Hat has only already uh, uh, open source kind of versions available uh, for most of uh, the clients. So we just went direct to start uh, trying some of the uh, container uh, platform, uh, including the OKD, which is a, a open source kind of solution uh, to accommodate the requirements that we are getting for, from our developers. Uh, as on going now to your question on, on SEF, um, yes, we, we've done uh, quite a number of tests and uh, currently we are using uh, a bit of uh, SEF uh, uh, storage internally for our, our, our internal services and uh, basically for dev, develop, uh, development and uh, UAT environments. Uh, the reason why we, we decided to go for enterprise version is because of uh, uh, definitely, we, 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 we have uh, good expertise internally, but uh, at, at the end of the day, you might need to get more support from the enterprise uh, company for, for your critical system in case uh, uh, you have uh, major failures that really requires more expertise. Excellent. And as your account manager, I can remind you, if you want access to any eval versions for test and dev, you can, you can just let me know. But I think that's interesting. That is something we, it's very common that people look at the open source world and then come to the same conclusion that, you know, to do things in a fully supported way is going to be very important. I mean, specifically speaking that's about fine. open, specifically speaking about open shift, um, you know, you guys are, you know, you're well down the line. It's deployed now. It's up and running. I think, Alex, you and your team are making pretty heavy use of that, that initial deployment that, uh, that's been made. What, what would your advice be to other customers who are just kind of starting to take that, those first steps with, with containers, cloud, microservices in general? Based on, on your experience, Alex, what advice would you give to, to people who are kind of maybe six months, a, a year behind where you are currently? I think uh, number one is to have a firm knowledge of their requirements and to understand the reason why they want to adopt a cloud native approach. Then number two is to, uh, before even any implementation is done, they should train their engineers 100% on Red Hat OpenShift, uh, both as a developer and administrator. Because we realized that we took, uh, we had a, a longer learning journey because we were learning on the job, which is quite exciting. But we realized that if we had prior training and knowledge, we would have achieved more and we would have solved other problems based on the knowledge that we have. So I think my advice to any new OpenShift customer is uh, uh, prior training for their engineers, uh, the developer and administrator courses, I really find them very useful and can unlock many obstacles as opposed to learning on the job. Still learning on the job is advisable because uh, it's the best form of learning, but uh, it's like groping in the dark or uh, moving, moving in the dark. I would pro uh, prefer uh, some bit of a month uh, high level training just to give their engineers a feel and to understand how OpenShift works. Number two, prior knowledge of Kubernetes as well, because uh, OpenShift is uh, Kubernetes, but now Red Hat have added uh, further automizations and more, manage, uh, more management services to make it easier to administer and troubleshoot and support. But prior uh, knowledge of Kubernetes will also make the op OpenShift adoption much, much easier and much palatable. Thank you. Thank you. And, and Chris, from, from your point of view, more from the infrastructure side, um, what, what advice would, would you be giving to your counterparts? Uh, just to add on what Alex has said, uh, training is very key. And uh, uh, we, we need to equip our engineers and the, the, the technical team that is going to uh, be working on these particular solutions uh, uh, with good knowledge uh, and uh, understand uh, the business requirement very well. Uh, in our journey, I, I think uh, we, as Alex had mentioned, we'd, we, had, uh, we had done a native K K Kubernetes environment uh, that uh, we ran with it for quite a number of, maybe around a year or something uh, before we started the journey for, for OpenShift. 
uh, this environment has given us a good comfort. We, we've understood um, uh, business requirement. We learned uh, about uh, more about containerizations, uh, more about uh, uh, microservices and containers in, in general. Uh, uh, and uh, guys uh, were able to to get uh, the mistakes and uh, apply them on this particular uh, apply the gaps on the on the OpenShift environment. So. Uh, there's quite a lot of learning that uh, we need to prepare our, our teams and uh, uh, equip them so that they can be able to uh, deliver the right solution for their business. Excellent. Thank you. So obviously we, we love to hear positive things from our customers, but um, there are always issues with complex projects. If we, if we if you'd cast your minds back to when OpenShift was being deployed, when Red Hat services were engaged and we were actually really getting going with that, um, did you did you hit any roadblocks along the way, or was it a smooth process? And if you, if you did hit some roadblocks, uh, was it straightforward to to get around them and can continue going? You could share, perhaps, uh, Chris. I'll continue with you if you could share a bit more of your experience around that implementation period, and, and then we'll hear from Alex as, as a new user, a new customer. Um, uh, generally, I, I, I'll not stick on OpenShift alone. I, I'll just uh, do in general for all my products that I've used for Red Hat. Sure. because I believe it's one family and all my solutions, uh, uh, if, if one is messed up, uh, definitely it messes up for all the other kind of solutions going forward. So uh, in, in terms of implementations, uh, the solution that we are able to do ourselves, uh, much of them, uh, uh, we had much of the materials, materials available uh, for learning and for, for, for uh, uh, integration as well. So that's, I can say it's never been a challenge. Uh, the only a bit that we, issue we ever had mainly was on support and i think uh, uh, uh chris uh, we, you've always gotten some uh, weird hours calls for from either me or my my other team members uh, to get support on some critical uh, support issues that have not been uh, taken care of as uh, as expected and uh, and i think much of this issue we've been able to correct and maybe come back better in the other kind of uh, products going forward yeah, that's the only challenge I can say uh, probably we've ever encountered. But in terms of implementation, uh, the, the, the implementation has always been smooth. The one that we've done, the one that we've integrated with uh, Red Hat, and uh, the recent one being the OpenShift uh, solution that we've worked with the Red Hat engineer end to end. And uh, they have always uh, been there for us, even after the uh, project implementation, the team is still available for us anytime uh, to help us on in on, on on integrating on all services that we are encountering any kind of challenges eh? so uh, the, the team has always been there eh? and uh, uh, we can count on them for any kind of uh, integration or any challenges that we encounter on our day to day operation even beyond the support hours fantastic thank you that, that's always uh, i've asked that question uh, to live audiences uh, in panel discussions before and there's always a a slight intake of breath, hoping that customers will say <laughs> generally positive things. So thanks, I think that, that's crystal clear that went well. I mean, Alex, during the implement, was the implementation period something that you were heavily involved with or were you and your team sitting there saying, look, you know, we just let us know when we can start using it? Because if you could give us some of, of your thoughts, uh, your experiences of, of that phase of the, of the project. Uh, the support that we get from the Red Hat engineers where they go above and beyond uh, their call of duty to get TIPCO documentation and then share with us the kind of configurations that we need to do on our microservice or, or on an open shift to be able to help us or rather to be able to identify where the problem is. So to me, that's something that really stood out during the project implementation phase. And from that, we've been able to do a lot of migrations and a lot of troubleshooting and make it more easier because of what we learned from the TIPCO, from the Red Hat engineers, sorry. So that's something which uh, to me really stood out. Number two, from uh, what I saw is uh, what the Red Hat sales engineer says and what the Red Hat support or implementation engineer does are the same. So we didn't have a scenario where the Red Hat sales person promised heaven and the Red Hat engineer delivered something different. So that's <laughs> to me is also uh, commendable to you, uh, Chris. Thanks so much. Fantastic. Good. Yes. I'm, I'm liking these answers. These, these are good answers. <laughs> yes. <laughs> good answers. So uh, my, my next question will we'll stick with you, Alex, as well is, um, have you started to see some return on that OpenShift investment? Are you starting to see 
better delivery times? Could you, are you able to notice any cost savings at, at, at this stage? So I'm keen to hear, you know, it's, employ, it's deployed, it's being used. Are there some real tangible benefits that you could put your finger on uh, today that you could perhaps tell us about? Yes, I think uh, I'll speak to two items uh, in terms of stability. Once we deploy a microservice and uh, with the capabilities that OpenShift provides, we rarely have a downtime. We have one, uh, in, uh, we have one microservice which we, it's very popular with our customers for offering airtime and uh, mobile data services on credit. So ever since it was deployed over two months ago, we've never had a single escalation on it. And uh, the business has had very good returns on that particular service. So in terms of stability, uh, which is the best product that we can offer a customer, Red Hat OpenShift is OpNotch, is TopNotch. And right now we are having other clients, not necessarily from my team, migrating to Red Hat OpenShift. We have a order management uh, project, which is normally, order management is the tool that we use to provision customer requests, mainly if it is fixed services, mobile data, or any other product that takes a form of an order. We have a solution that we are deploying uh, on its cloud native and we will deploy it on Red Hat OpenShift. Number two, uh, uh, the, micro, the, the service I told you for offering, uh, that I mentioned earlier for offering uh, airtime and mobile data on credit, before we, we started this, the loan book had really grown huge and commercial teams had come up with a way of scoring customers to be able to offer them more attractive products that will uh, make them repay their loans. So after we deployed that solution on OpenShift and the kind of uh, stability and throughput that it gave us, we have virtually reduced, we all, almost have 99% of loan repayments due to that microservice, something which the commercial teams are very happy about. They, had, they challenged us to deliver a solution that will give them a throughput of 1,500 TPS. We did that. And what we realized is even the, at peak uh, periods, the maximum TPS that we got from the customers is 400 TPS. So thanks to OpenShift, we are able to meet the demand of at least three years from now due to the kind of uh, uh, throughput that OpenShift gives us. So that, those two are uh, success stories that I have so far. Fantastic. That's, well, that's pretty clear. That, that, that's that's the very tangible results. That's excellent. Yes. Yes. I mean, Chris, just uh, I want to throw this question your way, and then I'll, I'll go back to Alex again. But ha have you seen, or are you seeing that OpenShift is changing the way uh, that you work? You know, we're, it, this is all about dev and ops, developers and operations. And what we often see is there's there's the, there are the technical challenges of deploying and using OpenShift. That's you know, cust uh, customers get used to using that. But sometimes there's there, there are cultural changes that need to be made as well. Is, is that something that you've, you've noticed in, from, more from your side, from the operations and infrastructure point of view? Yeah, sure. Um, uh, from my side, uh, we've noted a huge adoption of, uh, of uh, uh, this particular service. Uh, and uh, uh, there's uh, quite a lot in terms of uh, reducing, reducing our operational uh, efficiency, as in increasing our operational efficiency. Uh, uh, the, the number of days that we use to deploy a service uh, it used to be a number of days of if you do better, you can do it in hours. But uh, uh, this particular OpenShift solution has enabled us to do deployments immediately. So as long as this, uh, an approval has been done for that particular service, uh, uh, deployments are done instantly. And uh, with the automation tools that we have around us, uh, the code uh, review and uh, deployment uh, models that uh, our developers are using, it's quite easily integrates with the OpenShift solution to ensure uh, there is easy of ease of, of deployment and uh, operations going forward. Also, the number of teams that uh, were involved initially on the deployments, uh, you could find like uh, in my team we need uh, we need at least two or three engineers to be available for a one night kind of deployment that uh, currently just require the developers to be on their own uh, to run the deployments on their own and. Uh, deliver the solution without involving us. So my team has been 
uh, right now going forward involved in other innovative kind of options that we are really working on, not really on OpenShift, but just supporting OpenShift basically uh, uh, as an infrastructure solution, but uh, not really much involved in the deployment activities. Also, we've seen a, a, a quite a acceleration of uh, application development. Uh, most of internal uh, developers are, are really adopting this particular solution and ensuring uh, they don't go the static ways of doing uh, servers and uh, uh, virtual machines anymore. So they are really adopting uh, microservices and uh, encouraged to use OpenShift as a, as an, an, as a solution for uh, deployment. Also, the culture for the DevOps internally, uh, uh, it's really grown uh, from my team uh, all the way to uh, applications team, as well as uh, the, the digital engineering team and generally the entire uh, uh, digital IT uh, team. So you find uh, there is quite a, uh, a grown culture of DevOps and uh, uh, well integrated across from the infrastructure level all the way to the application level. Uh, also the, the speed and scale uh, is very uh, critical and especially how quickly we, we can move into market uh, for these particular uh, deliveries. So these are coming uh, very anti and uh, uh, OpenShift is doing us uh, wonders on this particular area. Fantastic. Well, I, I think the, the main thing I picked up there is that the developers aren't making you work nights anymore uh, when they're deploying stuff. I mean, we can put everything else to one side. That's great. You know, you've, got, you've got your evenings back. That's fantastic. Good. That, that's, sure. that's, a fantastic, that's fantastic to hear, Chris. Thank you. Um, and I'll, I'll turn the same question to Alex, and then we'll have just one, one final question before we we close off. Has this changed things a little bit culturally in, in your team as well, Alex? Have people had to, uh, you know, change their thinking a little bit? Or did you have to knock any heads together to say, guys, th this is the way things are going to be done now? Yes, uh, especially we have had culture change, especially uh, towards a more of a DevOps perspective, where and automation, where right now what we did earlier it used to be a developer writes code prepares the package, then sends it to a support person who will go ahead and deploy it. What we did is we wrote some CI CD pipelines, which once a developer uh, checks in code into version control, the pipeline will run. And since it's more of a continuous delivery as opposed to, to continuous deployment, once the approval is done, it will deploy all the way to production. And from there, uh, the QA team also have done their form of automated testing to make the testing to make to make regression much much better so that's one of the culture changes where right now at least a developer owns the service right from development to even production they have now kpis of availability uh, which initially used to be the preserve of the support teams then number two the culture change that i've seen is uh, right now we are now using the support teams as in, as developers not only as operations, but they can now be able to go in, plan for minor or major product revamps or even uh, meet technical debt. So this uh, second point of using support teams is a journey that we have started, but I am, uh, because right now the teams are able to work uh, and change their model, their thinking that, uh, that uh, earlier it used to be strict separation between support and uh, developer roles to right now just one role of delivery and operations. Uh, we are now seeing a movement towards where everyone is now a software engineer, regardless of whether you are hired as an uh, infra, uh, as a sub support or as a developer. So that's now the journey we, are, we want to achieve where each individual within the team is a software engineer, irrespective of uh, how you are hired. Thank you. That's fantastic. Uh, thank yes. you. That's, that's, that's really interesting to hear. Because I think we, we, we do often see that customers fall down a little bit if there are issues. It's not the technology. The technology works. Its promise is clear. But it's important not to forget the cultural aspect. And it sounds as if you, you guys have, have nailed that aspect of things. That, that's the message that I'm getting. So just partly in the interests of time and also partly because uh, it's also a Sunday afternoon when we're recording this and uh, my thanks once again for taking up uh, your time on a Sunday. Um, just perhaps uh, over here from both of you, and we'll, we'll start with you, Chris. Um, what, what's next? What's, what's the future? 
Um, tell us a bit about your, your plans, specifically around OpenShift in general, but, uh, but we'd be interested to hear what, what you see uh, is, is coming, at, coming down the line for you guys. What, what's your vision uh, and the direction that you're taking? Uh, just uh, to comment on uh, uh, one more thing. Uh, we have a wide uh, strategy on open fast, open source fast uh, uh, strategy, whereby we're trying to build uh, much as as much as we can uh, based on open source technologies. Uh, so going forward, we'll be uh, growing our estate of uh, open source technologies and also integrating with the existing, uh, uh, trying to grow the existing solution to achieve the best kind of uh, 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 best of breed kind of solution that can give our customers a better. Uh, uh, standard environment that uh, really meets their requirements. So going forward, uh, uh, this uh, modernization of our storage uh, solutions, as I mentioned, and I think uh, the major thing is on self storage, whereby we are going to be uh, moving on to software defined uh, storage solutions. And uh, we opted to use uh, self in this particular uh, case. And uh, that's going to be a huge one. I need now to grow OpenShift to run on OpenStack because uh, the current uh, setup of uh, uh, OpenShift runs on uh, a virtualized environment. So I need to take it a bit higher le level whereby I, I, I need to run it on a, on a better cloud uh, infrastructure. Uh, that is uh, uh, running OpenShift on top of OpenStack. So that's my, my major uh, focus going forward. Uh, definitely we'll, we'll, we'll grow the estate for automation and uh, see what else we can pick out uh, for integrating the existing solution. Definitely not leaving out our current estate for virtualization and uh, uh, automation that we already have. Fantastic, thank you. And Alex, what's what's uh, what's next in the pipeline for you? Yes, I think on on my side is the short term is to migrate all my Microsoft all our microservices from uh, Kubernetes to Red Hat OpenShift. That is a if we can be able to achieve that by end of next month, then medium term is to, and to long term, is to go into a sort of hybrid cloud scenario where we have some workloads running on uh, the cloud, public cloud in this case, integrating to the uh, on-prem cluster. So that one from an architectural position, we are still designing because the, from a, a, an architecture perspective, our enterprise service bus integrates the fast moving uh, customer facing side to the slow moving uh, BSS, which is built on legacy uh, hardware plus legacy uh, solutions. So what we want to, ach to achieve is a sort of hybrid cloud where some workloads on the, of the ESB are in a public cloud talking to the workloads on the on-prem uh, uh, applications. Then number two, we are mm -hmm. also in the journey of trying uh, of evaluating uh, Red Hat Fuse with a view of adopting it as part of our uh, ESB ecosystem. So that's something I believe we'll be able to come up uh, uh, with a decision by end, uh, end of this month and communicate our findings to you, Chris, so that we can take the discussion further. Thank you. Fantastic. I look yes. forward to that. So yes. actually, because this the conversation is flowing quite well, I just want to add one more uh, question before I end, um, and that's a little bit about the the sales culture. So we at Red Hat we do like to think we like to think we're a little bit different, um, but you guys you work with a number of vendors, and different vendors have different cultures and different approaches. Do you, what what advice would you give to your vendors in general when it comes to engaging with you? Do, does the hard sell work? Uh, is it product focused? What, what, what advice would you give to vendors when when they're in, when they're interacting with you and your teams? Alex, we'll we'll keep going with you, and then uh, we'll ask Chris, and then I, I think we can probably conclude from a from a timing point of view. So, Alex, how how would you? What advice would you give to your vendors when they're unfortunately not physically sitting down in front of you because we all have to do everything virtual for the time being? But uh, you're sitting there, you're engaging with your vendors. What what tips would you give for, uh, give to them? I think uh, I can only give one tip, uh, customer obsession. So if, if a vendor is really keen on uh, meeting the requirements of the customer and not forcing the customer to adopt his solution to meet uh, the customer's requirements, uh, to me, that will be a competitive edge. 
where a vendor is, is obsessed with meeting the customer's requirements, irrespective of whether their solution is uh, designed to work the way the customer wants. So to me, that would be a, a very, uh, I would go for a vendor who is customer obsessed as opposed to one who is very rigid and uh, insists that the customer should work the way the vendor wants. So to me, I think customer obsession is the only uh, competitive edge that a vendor should, if a vendor adopts that, then the sky will be the lower limit. Thank you. Fantastic. So yes. I'll take my notes and I need to become even more obsessed with Safaricom than I, than I, than I and the team Correct. are already. Um, yes. Chris, what, what, what would you say to, to vendors sitting down in front of you? What, what, what advice would you give when it comes to interacting with you and the teams in general at Safaricom? I think uh, on my uh, points, uh, I, I can break them into three, but they all uh, drill down to customer. Uh, uh, all the kind of uh, integrations that uh, we really have to do as, with any kind of partner, uh, they are all focused on delivering the customer needs. So any 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 vendor who, who, who is really focused on delivering customer's requirement, definitely we can comfortably work and engage further for even grow the, and even grow the kind of uh, uh, interaction that we really have and, and uh, engagement that we have with the, with the specific partner. Because at the end of the day, what really matters is our customer. So the value that we get from this particular solution and whether it meets out uh, the business uh, and the customer needs, those are my areas of focus. Excellent. Well, fantastic. Gents, uh, thank you. I think that was, that was a good conversation. I hope you enjoyed it. I, I certainly did. Uh, so yeah, it's time to, to, to drop off, but and I'm really hoping that we can meet face to face in Nairobi in due course because I'm sure we're all, I'm certainly going stir crazy stuck here home in Dubai. I'm looking forward to being out on the road and uh, spending some time with, with me and the Red Hat team being as obsessed as we possibly can with, with Safaricom. So let's hope that happens soon. So yeah, that, that was fantastic. So my thanks once again, we'll let you get back on and enjoy the rest of your Sunday. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Christopher.